So this is my topic. So before we jump on uh, to the actual debate, how many of you here uh, think that the left atrial appendage occlusion uh, should be offered to which of these following categories of people? How many think it's one? How many think it's two? Since we don't have this on the uh, thing, so just uh, show of hands. It's not on your, uh, on your clicker since I didn't give it to them on time. Show of hands, how many thinks it's one? How many think it's two? Okay, I already won the debate, Dr. Meyer. These are my disclosures. So when I Google Bernie Meyer, Professor Bernie Meyer, I mean, he's a, quite an accomplished man with uh, so many records, so many first several hundreds of papers to his credit, thousands of conferences, and, and innumerable number of patients that he has personally touched uh, in taking care of them. So my opponent is known for a lot of different things. Obviously, he's better looking than me. He has many more years of professional expertise. He owns a lot of Swiss watches, as I hear, and he can drink a lot more Polish vodka than me, and he knows a lot more Russians than me, he has more hair than me, of course, gray, and he's wiser, leaner, and meaner, and he leaves no holes unplugged. And he did his first PCI the year I joined kindergarten. And he has many more virtues than what I can come up with, but what he will not tell you is that I am on the right side of the truth. So if you asked our, our antagonist to the debate today, what he's going to say is the left atrial appendage occlusion should be offered for all comers. If there is an LAA, it needs to be occluded. That's his stance. And let's examine why that should not be the case. So when we really look at this issue of, OK, who should be offered and who is high risk? And these are all the very important questions that we try to answer. So let's go over some of these issues of who is at high risk. So anytime somebody has an ischemic risk, despite adequate anticoagulation, I deem to consider them to be relatively high risk, that something needs to be done about them to make the risk go away or get better. The high thromboembolic risk, but previous intracerebral bleeds on anticoagulation, this is another category of patients that, that we are all worried about. And then high thromboembolic risk patients who have a previous major bleeds on anticoagulation is somebody that, that we are obviously worried about. And people with higher chance to vascular score with, with higher risk of bleeding. They may not have a major intracranial hemorrhage, but the higher risk of bleeding are also the people that we worry about. And then you have a relatively uh, smaller group of patients or a relatively lesser important group of patients in thromboembolic risk with therapeutic range less than 65%. And those people who need to be on a dual antiplatelet agent uh, when they also need an oral anticoagulant these are the groups of patients I think that we can potentially consider as the so-called high-risk or non-indicated uh, non patients. So the treatment conundrum comes in when we take this particular group of patients. Well, what are the overall risks of oral anticoagulations in the, in, in the in general population and in this specific population that is at relatively high risk? And what is the risk of having no anticoagulation at all? And is there evidence to support that the left atrial appendage occlusion in this particular category of patients actually has any efficacy in the first place? And do the operators have the skill sets to execute this procedure? And can the world really afford a global left atrial appendage occlusion altogether? So we had several categories of risk scores that have come across and evolved over the years. We have the CHAT score, the chat 2 s score, the Orbit AF score. Everything points to that patients who have atrial fibrillation and multiple cardiovascular morbidities are a relatively high risk, and we can consider them to be um, a ticking time bomb that's ready to explode at some point during their clinical course. And we had warfarin for the longest of the time. It's widely disliked by all comers, all parties involved, including patients, physicians, media, industry. Everybody hates it. But there's a reason for that hatred because Warfarin is not easy to manage, and warfarin, despite being on warfarin, it doesn't really prevent the strokes 100%. And then the risk of bleeding is tremendously higher uh, with us. And the novel oral anticoagulants seem to fare a little better, but they're no different in terms of their overall risk for hemorrhagic strokes, and, and the overall risk of intracranial hemorrhage seems to be significantly worrisome that the problem of 
anticoagulation, appropriate, adequate, safer anticoagulation in these patients with atrial fibrillation that is not solved yet, despite four or five new oral anticoagulant therapies that are available. So then what happens to patients when they are either unwilling or they didn't want to take warfarin or could not take warfarin? So if you look at the Active A and Avros trials, it's quite evident that these patients' risk for systemic thromboembolism is significantly high and being on these antiplatelet agents does not risk, decrease the risk of bleeding in any significant fashion, clearly opening up the dialogue for a therapy that could potentially decrease this, this, this particular risk. So when you look at this particular paper uh, that recently uh, was published in 2012, what is the risk of strokes across the board in patients on different type of anticoagulants versus no treatment? The red bar at the bottom clearly shows that people who are not in any kind of anticoagulation are perhaps the patients with the highest risk of stroke. So these particular group of patients where you can put them in anticoagulation, you are bound to have a stroke at some point down the road. Now what is the risk of intracranial bleeding? The intracranial bleeding may be significantly lower, but the overall risk is not 100% zero. So what happens to patients? who are warfarin treated with, with various degrees of risk scores. And I think this is a pretty self-evident um, uh, slide in itself. And we all know, are very familiar with the data that as their bleeding risk increases, um, their stroke risk also significantly increases. And these two trends actually go hand in hand together. And the so-called group with the highest risk for stroke also happens to be the group with the highest risk for bleeding you are essentially in a catch-22 situation with really not many options. Perhaps the most recent Garfield data actually confirms what we have already known, that the patients, um, their risk of bleeding in the, uh, in the presence of uh, VKAs is significantly higher, and in the absence of the VKAs, their risk of stroke is dramatically higher, once again proving the point that these patients have, do not have many choices. How about the incidence of ischemic strokes in patients with intracranial hemorrhages? I think this is a subgroup of patients that we are all very interested in. And perhaps this is one group that I have done a lot of lariats in, in our institution. So based on this, um, three Danish nationwide registries comprising of more than 58,000 patients, uh, what you clearly see here is the patients who had a known intracranial hemorrhage, their risk for stroke or TIA subsequently is at least four times higher than those patients who did not have an intracranial hemorrhage. And those patients also have a relatively higher risk of major bleeding. And the overall all-cause all -cause mortality seems to be dramatically higher. So that means these patients whose overall morbidity is already so high it only takes another stroke to really push them off of the cliff and we essentially could potentially kill these people without uh, the presence of any options there. So if you can look at this, more than 10% of the intracerebral hemorrhages occur in patients who are on anti-thrombotic therapy. And aspirin increases the risk by at least 40%. And the presence of an oral anticoagulant doubles the risk at a rate of about 0 0.3 to 0 0.6 per year and intracranial hemorrhages are oftentimes catastrophic, and those of us who have dealt with this, and the neurologists here in the audience can watch for the damaging effects of the intracranial hemorrhages in a, in a much bigger way. So the risk of not being anticoagulated is very obvious. So there is an unmet clinical need for stroke prevention therapy in high-risk patients with AF where oral anticoagulation is contraindicated. And obviously, the risk of stroke is significantly higher than the general population. And so let's examine whether there is any evidence to show that left atrial appendage exclusion actually works in this group of patients. And I think we have some historical data that comes from the ASAP registry from the Watchman device, where um, the, the, the graph on the left side clearly shows uh, the 7.3% the um, risk of stroke is the expected risk of stroke based on the CHATS2 score, and then the bar in the middle at 5.1 is the expected risk of stroke on clopidogrel uh, used during all, all through the follow-up, and the, the bar in the blue demonstrates the stroke risk when they were uh, treated with the Watchman device. And the, the sort of extrapolated data from the ACP trial also shows a similar reduction in the ischemic strokes about anywhere ranging from 
57 to 63% uh, dep or 77% depending on the type of device that you take, clearly showing that there is enough evidence in the, in the form of registries, those smaller groups of patients, that this, this option actually works reasonably well. So let's examine the Lariat data. This is a multicenter Lariat long-term outcomes data from, uh, headed by Horst Sievers group, a total of 139 patients studied. And what you see here is there is the, the overall incidence of stroke in these patients is about 1.3% compared against a 6.3% of um, the expected uh, stroke risk from the, um, uh, based on the CHAT score. So all in all, this really makes a point that compared to the available options that are there at this point in time, risk stratified per CHAT score, these left atrial appendage exclusion devices seems to be of reasonable value providing us with, uh, with some sense of security and ability to take care of these patients. So is there evidence to show that left atrial appendage exclusion works for all comers in atrial fibrillation? I think we all started this field about 12, 15 years ago with great expectations and great perseverance. And the overall cumulative results that we have seen seem to be a little bit lukewarm. I mean, they are still encouraging. They are not terrible. They're equivalent to warfarin in, in most of the cases, but they are not strikingly better than the oral anticoagulation per se. So another important thing to really look at that is obviously these devices seem to have much less non-disabling stroke than those of uh, the control group with the warfarin. What really strikes home a point is the, the degree to which the prevail trial shows the superiority of warfarin than the, than the watchman itself. I know this opens up uh, a lot of interesting discussions, whether is it the device or is it just a random chance that these things were observed. Those are the things to really look at. I have uh, two more minutes and I will be done with the points I needed to make. So what I thought was also interesting to, to uh, see is the overall reduction in the ischemic stroke seems to favor warfarin whereas there, is a, uh, there seems to be a significant, statistically significant benefit with the overall cardiovascular and, and, and all-cause death events. Bleeding seems to be reasonable with, with minor bleeds. Um, so this graph essentially shows you for all those that fall above versus below. Uh, the prevail trial obviously clearly shows that the, the, the lack of clinical benefit from um, long-term follow-up in, in this particular group of patients. So that we kind of agree upon. Can we afford it on a global scale for all comers is the next question. I mean, this is a pandemic that reaches mammoth proportions of anywhere between three to 5% incidence globally. If you take that into consideration, and if we do a mere math, I think we are looking at anywhere between, let's just jump to this final the slide here. So if you took a 3% conservative estimate of incidence of 2020, based on Dr. Meyer's estimate, there will be 180 million left atrial appendages that needed to be occluded, accounting to a mammoth cost of 7,200 billion US dollars at an average of about 40,000 US dollars a pop. So with the complications rates of two to 16%, can everybody do it? Is the, does the world really have enough operators around to really do this procedure safely? Leave alone the United States or leave alone Europe. How about the countries in Asia? How about the countries in South America, Australia, and, and, and Africa, and all these other places? So it opens a great question, and it really offers a, 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 an appropriate uh, therapy in a very high risk, as I outlined here, but it is not for everybody. So based on the fundamental principle that sort of drives care, primum non non theory, the risk versus benefit ratio should always guide the appendage exclusion than the mere presence of an appendage alone. And with that, I would only request one thing to Dr. Meyer. Dr. Meyer, please do not plug me. This is a case, this is a case that Dr. Meyer did. This is an amazing feat of work in a sense that this is a patient that needed a tower, we did a tower. He needed an appendage ex exclusion, he needed an appendage excluder, and he also plugged the PFA on the way back and with a coronary angioplasty and a stent. So with that, I rest my case and look forward to hearing to Dr. Meyer. Thank you. Stay, stay with that. So thanks a lot.